Hi, I'm Larry McCullough. Welcome to the Hall Institute of Public Policy Forum Series on the American Voter 2012. 43 years ago, a book appeared by a Philadelphia journalist named Joe McGinnis that provided some startling information about how American political campaigns are created and managed. The book was Selling of the President 1968, and it was an inside look at Richard Nixon's media campaign of that year, which was revolutionary in its creative use of television to shape the image of a candidate using a communications medium that could reach tens of millions of voters all at once. McGinnis said that Nixon believed he could not count on straight objective reporting from the press to give him a positive image. And so Nixon used television throughout the campaign to reinvent and sell himself to voters, relying on television, uh, and I quote, the way a polio victim relied on an iron lung. Now today we have Professor Ben Dworkin, an associate professor of political science at Ryder University and the director of the Rebovich Institute for New Jersey Politics. He'll be talking about the selling of the candidate in 2012 in this election year. Professor Dworkin has an extensive career in politics and political science. He's been an assistant research director at the New Jersey General Assembly, an active member of local political organizations, a delegate to the 1996 Democratic National Convention, and a legislative aide to State Senator Matthew Feldman. Professor Dworkin was previously the CEO of Dworkin Strategic Communications and a vice president at RLM Finsbury, a leading global public relations firm where he specialized in media relations, strategic communications, and crisis management. So in talking about selling of the candidate, we're going to talk a little bit about how modern political advertising is, is designed and deployed. So if you can walk us through some of the basic steps, starting with step one, a candidate comes to a firm like Dworkin Communication or RLM Finsbury and says, get me elected, uh, help me, help me. What do you do? What happens? Well, first of all, thank you. I appreciate uh, this uh, opportunity uh, to be here. When a candidate walks into a firm, there are firms that specifically do political advertising. A lot of the firms like RLM and others don't do campaigns. What they do are public image and general public policy, uh, larger crisis communications. But they work for Coca-Cola as opposed to okay. candidate. Um, there are these specific candidate firms. And the first thing that anybody will do uh, is that they ask them about themselves. You have a conversation because the candidate is the product. What are you selling? What are you trying to be? What are the challenges? The first tactical step is to take a poll. That's uh, in the modern day of campaigning, a poll is your roadmap. It tells you who's out there, who likes you, who can be convinced, what issues are important to them. And these polls have become remarkably both sophisticated and very detailed. So we're getting deeper and deeper into finding out women between the ages of 30 and 35 who have children and live in this area and drive this kind of car, they are most responsive to an issue on health care or an issue on education. So if you're the candidate who wants to reach those people, that uh, becomes a very, very specific roadmap on how to do it. So you get to know the candidate and find their strengths and weaknesses, mm -hmm. I guess, from both angles, uh, because certainly some people will have negative reaction. Uh, so you, then do they figure out ways also to sort of downplay or, or, or you know, dis dissipate those? Or? Absolutely. I mean, you yeah. have to figure out what are the negatives, what, are, what people don't like you, what do you have in your, uh, in your closet, what, what, what can somebody use against you, and how do you offset that, how do you counter that, how do you mute that? So if you're, let's say, Mitt Romney, and you're uh, running against the president, you know you've got, uh, your opponents will paint you as aloof, as someone who's too wealthy to understand uh, the common man in America. That is clear from the beginning. You knew you were going to get hit with that kind of charge. If you're Mitt Romney and you have top political consultants, media consultants with you, what you do, as he does, uh, is that you come up with phrases. Look, I'm just as wealthy as Jack Kennedy was. I'm just like Franklin Roosevelt. I'm, we've always been electing very wealthy people, even if they, uh, you know, were much wealthier than the rest of the uh, the country. You will find ways to turn it to your advantage. Look at how great it's been uh, that uh, my career as a businessman has been. So these are the kinds of things how you shape uh, your image. Political campaigning is about a narrative. It's about trying to. Put pictures in our heads, which was a phrase coined by Walter Lippmann back in, 19, in the 1920s, a uh, legendary political observer and columnist. Pictures in our heads. 
How do you understand this candidate? Is this the person you like? Is this the person who most shares your values? These are the things that every candidate wants to try to do. And so the campaign becomes a collection of images, a collection of messages that will hopefully resonate with the voters. It doesn't operate in a vacuum. The other side is doing it too. So you have to be able to counter the negatives that are coming at you from the other side. You have to be able to promote your positives to the public. And all of this takes money, which is why our campaigns have increasingly become hugely expensive. Yeah. Now, who are some of the team members uh, at these agencies that that help craft the strategy and and the image of the candidate? Who do you need on the team? By and large, again, there's three things that you see with these political uh, media consultant teams. Uh, I call them the three C's. They are very well connected. They know a lot of people in politics. They um, are comprehensive. They take over the campaign from soup to nuts. That would include polling. It would include your social media, your internet outreach, even the day-to-day relations of operating the campaign, as well as general strategy and producing the actual TV commercials that we see uh, so much of. And the third thing is that they're creative. These are folks, a lot of political uh, consultants have downtime. What do you do when there's not a, not a big election here? What do you do in the other four months or the five months of the year? They go and they end up doing commercials for Coca-Cola, for Pepsi, for Ford. They have to find a way. So you have the same kind of creative talents you see in an advertising agency employed uh, here. They just happen to be more political. The team is basically broken down into all of these areas. You usually have a general consultant who oversees the overarching message. You have your film people, your technical people who will do the radio spots, will do the TV spots. You now have your internet people, people who are dealing with Twitter, responding to Twitter, using Facebook and other kinds of social media in order to promote your message, to connect your voters. And you have your management folks uh, who really oversee the politics of it, the day-to-day management of a campaign. And the larger these districts get, when we go from, we're talking whether it's a small council race, but even in congressional seats Mm -hmm. here in New Jersey, 720,000 people. We're gonna hit in the next 20 years, a million person congressional seat. That's how many people will live. So if you have to reach a million people, which is the size of a major city in America, that's gonna require a lot of money, it's gonna require a lot of people, and you need help, you need professional help to do that. Yeah. So what we're really saying is that uh, it used to be that uh, you know political parties had platforms, um, and that the campaigns were organized around you know uh, particular issues. Now we're saying, or we're seeing perhaps that 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 these issues and the campaign platforms are being kind of devised and created sort of behind the scenes, or or, or just to the point where they're just sort of there. There's a whole different, deeper level than what you see when you actually get to a convention. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the conventions, just because you brought that up, these are staged marketing opportunities for both of the parties. Uh, and they are extremely, uh, very detailed in, in their script. Everybody follows it. But larger, what we've seen over the last 50 years, really, uh, was that individual candidates broke away from the party. They wrote their own campaign. Yes, there are things that unite Democrats, there are things that unite Republicans overall, but each campaign has its own rhythm, has its own dynamic, each candidate brings their own rhythm. Not everybody is the same, and so you have a a different situation, a different set of dynamics uh, that go into play. So you sort of have the message creators, or the message shapers, Mm -hmm. and then they transmit to the actual political operatives on the field. They help uh, those political operatives implement the messages that have been designed in one room, where they've polled, where they've done focus groups, and they figured out, this is what we have to talk about. We have to talk about these kinds of values. We have to emphasize these kinds of phrases, these messages, these issues. And then the people in the field, the people who are out there organizing door knockers or organizing the phone banks that still go on, They take those messages. That is all part of an implementing, uh, it's an implementation process 
from the messages that are created with the candidate and the consultants. Now, what sort of audition process does does the consultant have to go on? I mean, how does how does RLM Finsbury or, or Dworkin Communications? How do you get the gig? <laughs> uh, Dworkin Communications, actually. Well, you know, again, I just wanted to be clear. It was a consulting firm, but it wasn't this kind of consulting. Okay. We didn't do uh, sp political consulting. Um, but these kinds of firms yeah. that are, are out there, how do you get the gig? You get the gig because of a, get, of a good one-loss record. Mm -hmm. That's the number one reason. Mm -hmm. I want to find people who win. Yeah. Uh, and if you won a particular race that I was impressed with, if I like the commercials you did, uh, then they will. Uh, mm -hmm. you're more likely to be hired. You're more likely to be hired if you're connected. This is a... Mm -hmm very, you know, it's a small insular world, the world of professional campaign management. People know each other. Yeah. They see each other at different campaigns. Mm -hmm. So somebody you might remember who was a junior staffer on a particular campaign ends up being the campaign manager mm -hmm. in a different state, in a different race. Who do they hire? They hire the people they know, the people that they like, the people with whom they have a relationship. Those are the kinds of things. <clears throat> Bottom line, is that a lot of it depends on who is paying the bills. Mm -hmm. The candidate is raising his or her own money, then it becomes the candidate's decision. Yeah. In many cases, political parties will be funding these mm -hmm. campaigns. It'll be the Republican uh, state party that'll really mm -hmm. be funding a major legislative race uh, in New Jersey or the Democratic state party. And because they are the ones who are writing the checks, they will get to make the decision on who does the polling, who does the commercials and those kinds of things. Uh, is the political consultant at this level really, do they stay with it all throughout the campaign? I mean, are they, you know, uh, if an event happens, I mean, if something happens overseas, I mean, how, how, how flexible are they in maneuvering from what they, the strategy they started out with to an opportunity, something that's happening, uh, you know, I mean, literally making, being able to make a quick open field cut Anybody who's worth their salt has to be able to move on their feet within 24 hours. Yeah. Hmm. You have to be able to cut a new commercial, get a new email blast out, yeah. write a new radio ad because you got hit with something, because yeah. the Supreme Court made a decision. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you have to be able to respond immediately and quickly. And if anything, that time, that window of response has gotten even smaller in the last 25 years. Yeah. Now, what are the, some of the professional roots of the people at these uh, consultant agencies? Uh, I mean, not just the freelancers who get hired to do camera work or something, but the people who really plan, the people who really, their minds are at work. Two things, I think, probably distinguish them, and there's, it's a broad category. One, they're extremely competitive. Mm -hmm. These are people who almost like, very likely, they did some kind of sport when they were uh, in high school mm -hmm. wow. because they were the kinds of people who were very competitive. Politics is a very competitive thing. This is yeah. what you're doing. The second thing that would distinguish them is that they've worked on a lot of campaigns. Mm -hmm. Simply the more experienced, they're campaign junkies. They go from campaign to campaign. They're now trying to turn it into a real career mm -hmm. uh, for themselves by being the consultant because they've had experience, because they've worked in a number of places. So a competitive streak uh, and experience and real campaign experience these are the things that distinguish the top level people. In terms of the a candidate's uh, really close circle of advisors um, who maybe been with them for years and they really believe in, in, in the candidate and what they stand for, uh, you've got them and they're interacting with these people who are the competitive consultants uh, and they're not complete mercenaries. I mean, they have their own political beliefs. But um, what happens when there's sort of a conflict, when, when uh, the, the, the candidate's people disagree with the advice they're getting from the consultant. It's the same thing that happens in any business when you have consultants who come in from the outside, Bain, McKinsey, somebody who's coming in and saying, here's how to run Texaco better or whatever. Uh, and you have your inner circle of the people who are part of your management team uh, who disagree. In the end, somebody is going to make the decision. Usually that's the candidate. Uh, and the candidate will go with his or her gut. Uh, and decide. I want to listen to my paid professionals. My own instincts tell me not to do that. I'm going to go with what my local folks who have been with me, my family, people I hold closest and trust most to have my interests at heart. These decisions are different in every uh, campaign, but it's like any situation where you have conflicting information. In the end, the candidate makes the call. Yeah. Do you think in the end political advertising really does sway voters? Absolutely. Okay. And we know this. I mean, the, the simple way we know this is because we do polling. Yeah. 
and we poll after uh, we see polling, both internal and public polls, uh, and it shows that advertising moves voters. You start going negative against a particular campaign, people don't like you as much. Uh, they remember that. They heard whatever it was. Uh, you know, the Willie Horton ad had a huge impact. That wasn't even, that was done by a third party group. It was even done by the Bush campaign yeah. in 1988. But this is an ad that's become legendary in political lore um, because it was a very stinging, a strong attack against Michael Dukakis and his record uh, as governor of Massachusetts when he was running for, uh, and therefore when he was running for president, it was uh, used against him. So sure, we know these uh, commercials make a difference. They move numbers. And that's why people continue to do it. And just to say that in terms of positive advertising versus negative advertising, not just comparison, but real negative, so-and-so is a bad guy, mm -hmm. paid for by the other guy. Yeah. Um, those kinds of commercials move them even further. Hmm. Negative trumps the positive, which is why you see it uh, used so often. I was rereading re uh, one of the early Vance Packard books. Uh, you know, it was talking about the hidden persuaders and about how advertising back in the 50s was really reshaping our society. Yeah. And he devotes a little bit on the 1952 and the 56 campaigns when all this was just starting to emerge. Uh, and, and he talks about how, how um, what he called the depth boys, the, the people who were the psychology uh, trained professionals who really were going into people's psyches trying to figure out, basically looking for that fear factor, what motivates people so much that, you know, in a negative way that they will, uh, everything that they know or think they know will fly out of their mind and, and they'll just go this other direction. And of course it's become much more sophisticated since then, but you're saying that still really is, is a really potent... Uh, Absolutely. It's, it, it's still the same basic idea. Yeah. That is, because polling and our sense of our ability to measure what people care about and how words might be shaped this way or shaped that way and make a difference in terms of what you care about or how you view an issue. If I call um, what's a, a pro-choice and pro-life as, as, as a clear example, both of those phrases, their advocates firmly believe in them, but they are also shaping for the unattuned electorate, the people who haven't made up their mind. Who wants to be anti-life? Mm -hmm. Who wants to be anti-choice? These are uh, words. And so a candidate is looking for the opportunity to shape any number of issues by using the right kinds of uh, phrases. And we've just become very sophisticated as, uh, as a political culture to be able to measure how to do those kinds of things. Do you think people, um, in, in any, has anybody ever polled about uh, people who are receiving these advertising messages? Uh, who are oftentimes very smart and educated, mm -hmm. th that any sort of resentment that they're being obviously manipulated, or do you think people just enjoy it? <laughs> <laughs> the, the ride. Um, there's lots of studies about this. I think what's clear is that at a certain point, advertising doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I mean, there have been ads that backfire. Uh, here in New Jersey, Doug Forrester ran an ad. He was uh, running for governor against John Corzine in 2005. Doug Forrester is a Republican. John Corzine had been married to a woman that he had met in kindergarten. Somewhere in, uh, in the few years before, he had separated from her. He, had, uh, he was dating uh, a powerful uh, union leader here in New Jersey. They took a quote, the, his, the Republican campaign, Doug Forrester's campaign, took a quote from the first wife mm. and used it look, he wasn't faithful to me, mm -hmm. I'm paraphrasing, so how much can you yeah. really trust him yeah. as governor? That, he was 10 points behind. You sort of throw everything at the yeah. sink, and yeah. the, you know, at the wall, see what's going to happen. He was 15 points behind wow. after that. So these kind of ads yeah. sometimes don't work. Yeah. They do backfire. John Corzine, to use another example, yeah. spent astronomical amounts of money, and at a certain point, it was backfiring because people saw so much yeah. of it. So you have to be sophisticated in your use. Um, not every attack will work. Yeah. Uh, not every positive ad will make a, a difference. There is a certain alchemy to the whole thing. You can try and poll, you can try and test, and sometimes people will buy it, sometimes they won't. I like that term alchemy because it's that whole idea of like looking for the elixir that turns things into gold and it's just, you know. You know, yeah. there, there's a reason why many people will consider what I teach the 
study of politics, not political science. Because hmm. a science means that there are rules. Yeah. Things that, you know, math is a science. Two plus two is four anywhere in the world. But how one gets elected is different almost every time. And hmm. so it's hard to call it uh, a science in yeah. a certain way. Well, Professor Dorkin, I want to thank you. I have one more question for you. Um, what do you believe is the most effective means or medium of political advertising today? What, what is really moving people? Uh, we've got some, we've got social media coming out now. We've got got you know people getting news from their smartphones now, and sometimes from no other source. But what do you think is in, in this 2012 election, I guess, in the national election? What medium are the uh, are our candidates really going to rely on to get their message across? Let me take a step back and say the most effective way uh -huh. is still the oldest way, which is that a person asks you. Hmm. Somebody goes and asks you and says, I like this guy, I think you should like them too, or this person, hmm. this candidate, please vote for this person. Hmm. If the candidate does it himself or herself, that is the number one reason why anyone will vote for you. Hmm. If somebody does it on their behalf, that is also effective. Social media is impressive and potentially very, uh, very persuasive because it allows people to connect with people they know. Yeah. And that is why it's a little bit, uh, it's different and offers new opportunities to shape people's opinions differently than our mass media that we've seen in radio yeah. and eventually television. Yeah. Uh, that will shape people's opinions. But the number one, people still have to go out and vote. Yeah. And they have to take the time to do that. The number one reason why anyone, the most effective way is still the oldest way. Hmm. Somebody asked you. Well, well thanks a lot. Thank and you. I good luck. the opportunity. Thanks again. Thank you. Well, that's been our show. And tune in again. The Hall Institute of Public Policy, American Voter, 2012.